uh, a lively set of music. Uh, it causes us to read the beginning of chapter 8 of Joshua, which is where we're going to be, it's chapter 8 of Joshua, to wonder why the excitement in the music, but the somberness in the beginning of the chapter. And the answer is, the end of chapter 8 is victorious. So we are going to get there, but please open in uh, your Bibles to Joshua chapter 8. This, I'm hoping, is not confusing. This is the attack on the city of Ai. They've already done that once. So I'm hoping I'm not going to be confusing when I talk about them attacking Ai, because first time, Israel got whipped. Second time, God gives Israel victory. So I don't, if in this technologically advanced world, maybe we call it Ai 2.0. I don't get it either. We'll just call it Ai. Joshua chapter 8, starting in verse 1. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise and go up to Ai. See, I have given it, or I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land. And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. Lay an ambush against the city behind it. So Joshua and all the fighting men arose to go up to Ai, and Joshua chose 30,000 mighty, mighty men of valor and sent them out by night. And he commanded them, Behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind it. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you remain ready. And I and all the people who are with me will approach the city. And when they come out against us, just as before, we shall flee before them. And they will come out after us until we have drawn them away from the city. For they will say, they are fleeing from us just as before. So we will flee before them. Then you shall rise up from the ambush and seize the city. For the Lord your God will give it into your hand. And as soon as you have taken the city, you shall set the city on fire. You shall do according to, to the word of the Lord. See, I have commanded you. So Joshua sent them out. And they went to the place of ambush and lay between Bethel and Ai, to the west of Ai. But Joshua spent that night among the people. Verse 10. Joshua arose early in the morning and mustered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel, before the people of Ai. And all the fighting men who were with him went up and drew near before the city and encamped on the north side of Ai, with a ravine between them and Ai. He took about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. So they stationed the forces. The main encampment was north of the city and its rear guard west of the city. But Joshua spent that night in the valley. And as soon as the king of Ai saw this, he and all his people, the men of the city, hurried and went out early to the appointed place toward the Arabah to meet Israel in battle. But he did not know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel pretended to be beaten before them and fled in the direction of the wilderness. So all the people who were in the city were called together to pursue them. And as they pursued Joshua, they were drawn away from the city. Not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. They left the city open and pursued Israel. Then the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out the javelin that is in your hand toward Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the javelin that was in his hand toward the city. And the men in the ambush rose quickly out of their place. And as soon as he had stretched out his hand, they ran and entered the city and captured it. And they hurried to set the city on fire. So when the men of Ai looked back, behold, the smoke of the city went up to heaven. And they had no power to flee this way or that. For the people who fled to the wilderness turned back against the pursuers. And when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had captured the city... And that the smoke of the city went up, then they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. And the others came out from the city against them. So they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that. And Israel struck them down until there was none left that survived or escaped. But the king of Ai, they took alive and brought him near to Joshua. Verse 24. When Israel had finished killing all the inhabitants of Ai in the open wilderness where they pursued them, and all of them to the very last had fallen by the edge of the sword, all Israel returned to Ai and struck it down with the edge of the sword. And all who fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, all the people of Ai. But Joshua did not draw back his hand, with which he stretched out the javelin until he had devoted all the inhabitants of Ai to destruction. 
Only the livestock and the spoil of that city Israel took as their plunder, according to the word of the Lord that he commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned Ai and made it forever a heap of ruins, as it is to this day. And he hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening, and at sunset Joshua commanded, and they took his body down from the tree and threw it at the entrance of the gate of the city and raised over it a great heap of stones, which stands there to this day. That's quite the epic story, but this is the word of the Lord. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. What a, uh, a graphic story. But Lord, let us see that your power accomplishes victory. In something that seemed lost and gone, you brought about a victory. And so, Lord, I pray that you would encourage hearts today, knowing that not all is lost when you are committed. So, Lord, be with us this morning. Help me to be clear. Help those who are listening uh, to be encouraged to trust you. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Do not fear and do not be dismayed. This is a tone that the book of Joshua doesn't have a lot of. It's all victory and conquest. It's all winning and killing the bad guys. This is a somber and a calculated tone. This is, this is God saying, all right, Joshua, we're going we're gonna to get up and go again. Okay. Has anybody ever moved into a house? By the way, everyone's going to raise their hand to that one for the most part. When you moved in, was there a man laying on the couch? If there was, how long would you let him stay there? He's going to get up in the middle of the day, and he's going to get in your fridge, and he's going to eat your food. When the cookies are done, he's going to be the first one to the oven to eat some. Right? He's going to eat your ice cream. He's going to leave the water running at night. He's going to slam doors all night long. How long would you let that guy stay there? Only one day? Only one day? Yes. That's right. One minute. one minute, yeah. Yeah. Why? Why doesn't he have the opportunity to stay there? Because it's your home. You paid for it. You built it. Whatever it is, is your home. He doesn't have the right to stay there when it's yours. God has given Israel this land. Was it good enough for them to just move into the land and co-inhabit the land with the Canaanites? It's doable. You could let that dude lay on your couch for a long time. It would be annoying and distracting and stuff. You could let him stay there, but you wouldn't. Why? Because you know what it means to take possession of something. Israel, Israel here is called to take possession of the land, and there are people laying on the couch and it's time to kick them out. Okay? That's, that's, the, that's the purpose of the story. Why is God being so calculated and somber in his discussion with Joshua? Does anybody remember last, last week's discussion of chapter 7? Israel had tried attacking Ai, and they got beat. Okay? So you go up to the dude laying on your couch, and you try to kick him out. Instead, he kicks you out. How long before you try again? Maybe you just feel defeated. Maybe you're like, fine. That's your side of the house. This is my side of the house. You buy half the groceries, we'll be fine. That's the way Joshua is feeling right here. He's feeling defeated. In fact, he's the leader of a nation that just a matter of days before had been the, the cursed people of God. Do you remember the terminology that the chapter 7 uses? Because this man Achan had taken some of the spoil of Jericho, the entire camp of Israel is now cursed. They go up against Ai, and because God works sovereignly against them for them to be beated by the beated, beat by the people of Ai, which by the way is probably pronounced I, but that would be confusing in our language because I is already a word. So I'm going to keep calling it Ai. They went to Ai and they get beat? God's against them? How long would it take for you to say, you know what, we're going to try that one again? You know what Joshua needed to hear? He needed to hear God's voice. He needed to hear the word of the Lord saying, I have taken care of something here. There's going to be victory here. And in order for us to follow the story, we have to see there's, there's a flow in how this works. 
See, we're going to see that God, God has given his favor to the people. And because he's given them his favor, he then uses his power on their behalf. His favor, which brings about his power, will result in God's victory. This is how one takes possession of the promises of God. They require God's favor, God's power, and God's victory. And this is the task at hand for the people of Israel, and it was working out well until Jericho. But they can't co-inhabit the land, so they have to engage in conquest. So, let's think back. Chapter 7 opened with a painful description. The people of Israel had broken faith in regard to the devoted things. So the anger of the Lord burned against them. We talked about the anger is an in-your-face anger. It's not a distant disdain. It's an active, intentional, willful, aggressive anger against someone. God's anger was against them. But catch what happens in chapter 7. Because doesn't chapter 7 end well? Yes, it does. They were able to remove another sinful influence from their life. Achan, the bad guy, he and his family were put to death. It ended up great. Yay. So good, they actually put a heap of stones over Achan's body to remind the people that God had done this for them. But it started out bad. God's anger burned against them. It ends up good. Heap of stones to remember the good. What happened in between? God stepped in and helped his people. Catch the timeline here. If you, again, if you remember back, God's anger was burning against Israel. But Israel doesn't know that, so they attack Ai. And they get beat. And so Joshua cries out to God. And God tells him, What? You guys are actually sinful. You need to find the sinner and get rid of him. What condition was Israel in when God lovingly and graciously spoke the truth and the solution to Joshua? They were the cursed people. We have to understand the timeline here because God ex expressed his grace toward them while he was angry at them. Catch that picture. When, when the New Testament speaks of Christ's sacrifice to save us from our sins, God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, okay, i.e., God has anger against us, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The, the chronology is an important thing to recognize. In God's anger, he bestowed his grace on Israel. That, that is not the kind of story that allows us to say Israel earned God's favor. Israel had already earned curses. But God on his own graciously reached out and provided a way of safety for them. One of the definitions that, that is used for the word grace is to incline oneself toward, intent on bestowing benefit, God leans toward Joshua. And he says, I have something for you to protect you from destruction. Destruction from me, but to protect you from destruction. And so he gives it. They follow it, his commands and his leading. God points out who Achan is and, and they put him to death and they raise a heap of stones. They now enter into chapter 8, a blessed people. They have the, the favor of God because the grace of God worked through the problems and the sin of life to show them he has chosen them because of his own good purposes. So when chapter 8 opens... Yeah, Joshua's bummed, but God's going, saying, you now have my favor. Now is the time to attack Ai. So get up and get going. Don't fear and don't be dismayed. Don't be afraid of what's coming in the future. And don't be so worried about the past that you're paralyzed. Because the difference between the opening of chapter 7 and the opening of chapter 8 is God's favor. Now, I do have to point out that a lot of trusted Bible commentators basically blame Joshua. 
You didn't ask God how you're supposed to attack AI, and that's how you lost. Okay, and I disagree with that. Because we're told explicitly in the beginning of chapter 7, God's anger was already burning against them. He wasn't angry with them because they were presumptuous in their attack of AI. They were presumptuous in their attack of AI because God's sovereign will was against them. But now in chapter 8, God's sovereign will and grace is bestowed on them. So now they have favor. So as we get into chapter 8, don't, uh, don't fear, don't be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you, arise and go to AI. Again, different plan, but it's not the new plan that saves the day. It's God's favor that saves the day. So as we read the rest of chapter 8, we have to recognize God's favor is on these people. Okay, And the end of the command, this is the end of verse 2, lay an ambush against the city. So Joshua then engages in this. They're going to go and they are going to work beautiful things. Now when I say beautiful things, I need us to recognize in our culture we don't like this idea of going and killing 12,000 people. Right? We, we kill all the bad guys out in the field and then we come back to the city and we kill all the, the old men, the women, and the children. That kind of hits us like, God's a loving God, huh? Why is he killing all these people? And that is, I'll admit, that is a, a tough one to answer, but it would be easier to answer if we had been living at that time. You see, even centuries before this, and I brought this up before, but centuries before this, God had told Abraham, your descendants are coming back when the full iniquity of the Amorites is filled up. You know what that means? God's intent was to destroy the Canaanites anyway. He's using Israel to exact justice on those that deserve it. When we say 12,000 men, women, and children, we're not talking about 12,000 men, women, and innocent people. These people have earned the wrath of God. Hailstones from heaven, the earth opening up and swallowing them, the earth being covered with a flood, these people have deserved God's wrath. It's coming to them. Did they have the opportunity to accept God's grace? Rahab did. Rahab recognized who Israel was. Rahab recognized who God was. And she committed herself to trust that God of Israel. Did these people know the same things? Guaranteed. Guaranteed. So as we engage in this, we have to see this is a just thing. Not only that, but all mankind deserves that kind of a destruction. In fact, Israel in chapter 7 deserved that destruction. Okay? What we see here playing out is not 12,000 dead people. We see God's blessings poured out on those who don't deserve it. You and I should be thankful for that one as we stand before God, those who do not deserve His grace. We do not deserve his benefits and we do not deserve his favor, but he's given it. And so here we stand before him. So as, as we can picture in our minds, Israel engaging in this campaign. It's a long section, verses 3 through 17, this description of the battle. They, they make the trek. Now they're probably leaving from Gilgal and they're probably going to... Um, well, they're going to AI. We're not exactly sure where AI is. There's a couple of good options, and they're about a half mile apart. So we're pretty sure of the region where he's going. Okay? It's about 13 miles away, but at rate, you have an elevation change of over 3,000 feet. So it's not an easy walk. They, they have to get there. But also, AI probably saw them coming. Okay? There's another important thing about this region around AI. It's full of hills and valleys. Okay? Even though Ai is probably pretty close to Bethel, maybe a mile away, there's enough of a ravine or a hole in the ground to hide 5,000 soldiers. That's pretty cool. This is an excellent spot for an ambush. Wow, God really knows what he's talking about. Let's ambush him. Cool. Great plan. Guess what God's going to do with this ambush? He's going to take Israel's previous defeat... 
And he's going to turn that defeat into victory. How is he going to do that? Read verse 6 with me. Or maybe you can, in your head, and I'll say it out loud. They will come out after us until we have drawn them away from the city, for they will say, they are fleeing from us just as before. So, they will, so we will flee before them. You see, the plan is, the first time we showed up with just a couple of thousand people, now we've got tens of thousands of people, and now we're going to do it. But as soon as we see the men of Ai come out, we're going to pretend to be a scared bunch of people. And we're going to run away, because they're so scary. And what's that going to do to the people of Ai? It's going to make them arrogant. He's going to play on their arrogance. What happened last time Israel attacked Ai? They tucked tail and ran then too. They tucked tail and run a second time. Ai's going, we got this. God is actually taking previous defeat and he's working present victory. When Paul says that God works all things to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose, he may very well be using places or situations of the past that seemed like broken, defeated, ruined things. We look at them with regret and we look at them with pain and God's saying, those are the situations that I'm going to utilize to produce victory. So God works this good thing in their lives, utilizing the arrogance of Ai. And not just Ai, even the men of Bethel, they run out. Every fighting man chases them down. Okay? That's a, that's a crazy spot. Can you picture that in your head? Let's say you've got 25,000 Israelites running away. And you've got, let's say, 12,000 Ai and who are chasing after him. What does it look like? Can you hear it? Can you, is there dust involved? Is it a little bit chaotic? People shouting commands, crying for their lives. And then this crazy thing happens. In the story, it's told in a word play. And it's, in, it's, it's with this word, hand. Hand. That, that's weird. Verses 18, 19, and 20 is where the word play um, lands. Verse 18. The Lord said to Joshua, stretch out the javelin that is in your hand toward Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the javelin that was in his hand toward the city. And the men in the ambush rose quickly out of their place. And as soon as he had stretched out his hand... They ran and entered the city and captured it, and they hurried to set the city on fire. So when the men of Ai looked back, behold, the smoke of the city went up to heaven, and they had no power to flee this way or that, for the people who fled to the wilderness turned back against the pursuers. Do you know why that word power is important? It's the same word for hand. It's the exact same word. Okay? Translated, can be translated a number of different ways. The word play is power. How many times can you think of in even Joshua's life where a leader of the people held out his hand over a situation? Well, Joshua was second in command when Moses held out his hand over the Nile River. And what happened? Turned to blood. He was there when Moses held out his hand over the Red Sea. And what happened there? It opened and they walked through on dry ground. He was down in the valley fighting against the Amalekites when Moses raised his hand over the battle. And as long as Moses' hands were in the air, Joshua was winning. But as soon as Moses would lower his hands, Joshua would start losing. So what happened? These two guys, they come and they hold Moses' arms up for the rest of the battle. And Joshua leads them to victory. What's the deal with hands? And what we see in this picture is Moses didn't do anything. Everybody caught that? Moses doesn't know how to turn water to blood. He doesn't know how to pile up water at the Red Sea, and he does not affect a, a battle from a distance with his hands in the air, but God does. What was the purpose of Moses' hands? He is the illustration or the symbolism of the power of God in the situation over which the hand is raised. 
Moses is God's ordained man. When Moses raises his hand over the, the Nile River, God's power is there. When he raises his hand over the Red Sea, God's power is there. When he raises his hand over the battle, God's power is there. So when Joshua is called to raise his hand over the battle with Ai, God's power is there. They not only have God's favor to engage in the battle, they have God's power in the battle. Symbolized by the raised hand of Joshua. In fact, it's contrasted with the power of Ai. It's not Joshua's power against Ai's power. It's God's power against Ai's power. No wonder they had no power against it. That's a vitally important thing to recognize. Israel's success in battle is not based on a good plan. It's not based on hard work or even necessarily solid leadership. It's based on the the favor of God so that he would utilize his power on behalf of his people. And so how are you going to go about wrapping up this story? The hand is up. Israel is killing them, right? As Israel was running away, Ai and Bethel come out. The ambush comes in, burns the city, and then they come out too. And now Ai and Bethel are stuck between them. And they're in the crossfire and they die. Yay, they go back and they kill everybody else in the city and they burn it, but they keep the livestock as plunder. How do you memorialize this? You, you build a heap of memorial stones over Ai's king. And we've talked about memorial heaps before. This is the third one that we've seen. What's the purpose? Oh, a couple years later, little Johnny's walking along. Hey, Dad, what's that pile of stones? Let me tell you a story. It's a crazy one. And little Johnny gets to hear about the favor and the power and the victory that God worked that day. When God engages his power in something, victory is guaranteed. There is nothing that stands against the power of God. Nothing. So when God, by his grace applies his favor to his people in such a way as his power is expressed to win the victory in whatever situation his people are in, it is always successful. Every time. That is why, because that's that's the overflow of his nature. It is always this way. So they commemorate it with a heap of stones. Now tell me something. If you had been in Israel, and you're a fighting man, and you had heard, God has his favor for us, and we're going to win the battle, does that encourage you to leave your sword home, or to pick it up? Today, we hear things like, God is taking care of things in your life, so what do we do? God's got it taken care of. I'll stay on the couch and eat my Cheetos. Right? Right? Some people like Cheetos. I don't, actually. I should have picked something better. These people were not encouraged to do nothing because God's got it taken care of. They were encouraged to do something because God's got it taken care of. They didn't hear, God's got it done, so sit back and relax. It was, God's got it done. Get your sword. I wouldn't be surprised if they even sharpened their sword. You, you engage in the battle with passion and zeal, commitment, because you know that God has it taken care of. How many of us here, though, can recognize that the real struggle in our life is against our own sin? The, it would be easier if what we struggled against was AI. I got a problem. I got to go kill somebody. That would be way easier. We shouldn't do that, by the way. Just don't leave at that part of the sermon. Don't kill people. But wouldn't it be easier? Oh, so much easier. Instead, who, where is our enemy and where does he live? Jesus himself said, if your hand causes you to stumble, hack it off with your sword. Okay? We have to recognize the greatest sinful influences in our lives are ourselves. 
The first step of removing the sinful influences from my life was Jesus on the cross. And that was done perfectly. But that's not the end of the conquest over sin. That's the beginning. That's just the first one. He may have paid it perfectly to make your attack against your sin a sanctified and holy battle. But that battle isn't over. But rather, it's empowered by the cross. We all suffer from our own sin. Our gossip, our greed, our slander, our hatred, our lust. We, we are constantly attacking ourselves with our own sin. Now, most of us don't even recognize it. We, we get used to our gossip. Well, we, we, we heard some information, so we're going to ask someone else to pray. Through a two-hour-long telephone conversation that never actually prayed for the person that you heard about. Okay? Wives belittling their husbands. Husbands neglecting their wives. People railing in anger against one another based on simple miscommunications. Our own sin is our greatest enemy, and God has called us to engage that enemy. Put off the deeds of darkness. Put to death the deeds of the flesh. Put off sin. A constant, constant reminder throughout the New Testament. And most of the time that conversation comes up, um, which by the way, that's the sanctification process. In case we ever hear that talked about, we're being made more like Christ. You know, the sanctification process is usually illustrated one of two ways. One, the potter's wheel. Two, the vine. And the potter, he takes the lump of clay, which is you, and he flops you down on the, on the spinning wheel, and he begins to apply pressure to you to shape you into what he wants you to be so that you are a useful vessel in his service. Okay? And it, there's pressure, and there's pain, and, and oh, it's, it's, it's horrible, but it's worth it. And then the vine dresser, he knows what's best to get you to be as fruitful as possible. And he looks at you and he sees all these weird things growing off. So he takes his pruning shears and he goes through and he cuts off all the things that are fruitless so that you can be more fruitful. And it's painful, but it's worth it. And those are true illustrations. But watch what Joshua has to say about it. These people had the favor of God the power of God on their side, and God's victory. My word, it's a victorious thing. God has promised to rid you of the sinful influences in your life. And he can accomplish it. He can accomplish it. You might look at your greed and say, I'm so far gone, there's no possible way. And yet Joshua says, it's already the Lord's. When, when David stood against Goliath, that was his perspective. It wasn't, man, I hope this goes really well for me. It was, it's already the Lord's. It's already the Lord's. That's why David stepped to the battle line, because it was a guaranteed victory. When we view our sanctification process from the eyes of victory, we should be encouraged to engage in that. Is it going to be painful? Well, yeah. I mean, the potter illustration and the pruning illustrations are still true. But man, it's good. The sanctification process is good for us. And maybe, maybe the part that we don't recognize is that it is good. I, I've been a slanderer for this long already and I'm making it work. Why would I need to change anything? I've been an adulterer. I've been a gossip or I've whatever. All of us have a sinful influence that lives within our hearts and God's desire is to crush that thing. Burn it. Ambush it. We're using terminology that's military, it's active, it's aggressive, and it's dominating. And victorious. Your sin is in God's sights. Is it in your sights? Sharpen your sword. This, this here's the, the writer of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. By the way, that's a reference to all the other people that can declare that God has been victorious in their lives. 
When you read Hebrews 11, seeing how God had worked in this person and this person and this person, we are surrounded by that great cloud. Who's in that cloud? Joshua, who saw the favor, the power, and the victory of God. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's victory terminology. Paul, he, he finished it this way in Romans 8. Please turn with me to Romans 8. This section is talking about how God has used his ways his means, and his power to accomplish salvation in the lives of people. And if that's the situation, like Joshua's situation, God had worked this victory, who could ever stand against us? I don't even know where to start with this. It really starts in chapter 8, verse 31, but we're going to skip to 37. In all these things we are more than conquerors. You may view your sanctification process as a painful and unjoyful problem. You don't even want to get up in the morning because God is laying the weight on you. But Paul is saying you are more than conquerors through Christ. He has done all of this to make you his and protect you. You are now more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 38. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation including your own sin will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. My prayer to, for you today is that you would see your sin as the next thing that needs conquered. That you would recognize the problems that your sin make in your own life. They not only break relationships between you and those around you, they break your relationship with God. And they're not just a hidden thing. They're like a, a festering thing. They get worse over time and they ruin lives. But this is a... <laughs> this is a story of conquest. So I would encourage you to engage in that conquest. Let's pray. Lord, you hate sin. You hate sin in us. You hate our sin. Lord, teach us to hate our sin. You long to remove that sin from us. Teach us to long to remove it also. Lord, help us to not be content with just how things are going. But Lord, help us to sharpen our swords knowing that you, the, the victory is ours in Christ. Thank you for giving us Christ. A perfect first sacrifice. A perfect pay, payment for the penalty of sin. A perfect promise of eternal safety in your presence. Lord, you are so gracious toward us to give us your favor and your power and your victory. Lord, teach us to walk in it. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.